Hello and welcome to Cayman Conversations. I'm Ralph Lewis and today is the first day of our new daily series, which is produced by Cayman Times. And it's my pleasure to have conversations with former Governor Martin Roper and Stuart Wilson. Cayman Conversations seeks to elevate the level of media conversations with our special guests from all walks of life. As we develop our program, listeners and viewers will have opportunities to submit comments and questions. The 90-minute show will also feature two conversations and music videos from local artists. The now former governor of the Cayman Islands, Martin Roper, left the islands last week and reviewed his time in Cayman in a final interview with Cayman Conversations. Here is that interview, which will be followed by a conversation on the creation of Caymanian Times. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Ralph. Pleasure to, pleasure to see you. <laughs> thank, thank you for being on Cayman Conversation. By the way, this is our first interview or conversation for a new series, which can be launching next week, Monday. Okay. So it was my distinct pleasure to invite you to be on it for the first. Oh, well, well, thank you very much. It's also my, my, my pleasure to be to be your first guest in what will be my last uh, press interview in the Cayman Islands as governor. Um, so um, there we go. <laughs> well, we have 30 minutes to capture four and a half. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll do fine. Okay. Okay. How is your wife Lizzie doing? She's she's doing very well, thank you. And we're both feeling obviously mixed mixed um, emotions. Obviously very sad because we're we're going on on Wednesday evening on the, you know, the 29th of March. And um, after four and a half years, we've met so many people. We feel very very connected to the community, and we've. You know, we've we've got some absolutely wonderful memories. So it is it is it is a bit mixed, sad on the one hand, but also full of full of really wonderful memories for us. Love. Uh, in our last interview, I asked a question: you, um, How did you get so in tune with social media? And I was impressed <laughs> with your connection to the community and your involvement in Facebook and everything. And you you told me that some that you learned. How is it going now? I, I think it's gone really well, actually, in, in Cayman. And we, we, I knew when I got here that um, I wanted to try and use social media. I'd, I'd used it using Twitter as an ambassador in a previous post, and I saw the impact that could have to reach new sec sections of, of the community. So I wanted to do something here. And uh, you know, we started Instagram from scratch, and now it's, it's up to 10,000 followers, which is pretty good for, for, for Cayman. So it's, we also have about 10,000 on Facebook. Um, and I've still got the Twitter account as well with about 10,000. So, I mean, that's 30,000 in total, which is quite a big, a big number. I think what's good about the social media pages is we, I've tried to really get into the community and understand Caymanian culture, heritage, traditions, you know, with the seafarers and getting into the districts and talking to our seniors. And, but I'm also actively involved in a, in a lot of, um, charitable groups and as patron and the work that they do all the service clubs that rotary is the lions so i think there's there's it's a it's a real diverse cross-section of the community and i hope it's made a a small modest contribution to bringing us a bit a bit closer together i don't think so i don't think so was it what you anticipated before arriving here the job or or the social media the job the, the job community. the job and the community um, no i mean i think I, we we go feeling incredibly um impressed and 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 I, you know that my overriding sort of feeling is that there are, there are just so many very good decent people out there in the community who just want to make the lives of other people better and we've been privileged to be be a part of that to be involved in so many different activities and um, and it, it's really sort of heartwarming just to see what a wonderful community it is. And, and that's something we will really miss. We really will. It's, uh, it's a fabulous community and there's, there's, there, is, there is so much going on and so much activity out there. Well, I'm sure the invitation is wide open and you can all <laughs> yeah. fly back and right. spend some time in the future. All right, you've been very busy. And I've noticed it being in media myself. I had an article when you arrived in the newspaper and followed you along a number of years uh what would you say is your biggest accomplishment wow um i mean i think obviously I've, i was here for the covid pandemic so i think everybody probably i'll probably be remembered as the covid governor I'm sure that will be one of my <laughs> one of my epitaphs but I, I and that wasn't just about me obviously as governor but i played a, a key role in that it was a it was a fantastic team team effort but you know I, we did 
something like 70 to 90 press conferences on the trot and trying to you know, give the community positive news, trying to reassure, trying to remain upbeat, but also realistic because there was a lot of uncertainty. I think getting the vaccines in and getting them in quickly, um, I think we were the first overseas territory to, to get them. I went to the airport with the then premier to meet to meet a crate. You don't often go to the airport to meet a crate, it but is. we made yes. an exception for those vaccines. And, and you know, we, we locked down and protected the health of people. And then we had a pretty much safe bubble for a, a year. Yes. But then COVID, we did open up and, and COVID did sort of take off, but the vaccines protected people. And, you know, we had 80, 85% of people vaccinated. And I think it's that saved many hundreds of lives. And so in a way that, that I suppose is the contribution that, that I think people will remember most. And I think it underlines the real value of that UK link, uh, because in our time of need, the UK did come to our support and we, the overseas territories were part of the UK vaccine rollout immediately. And you know, we looked around the region and that wasn't quite the same for, for other countries. So, so I, I think that the, the, obviously COVID does stand out, but the, I think our health professionals, um, everybody, the, 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 the then premier, um, the, the whole community, stepped up and I think did a did a fantastic job and I and I do think we can with justification say we had one of the best responses anywhere in the world to uh, to covid which is something that everyone can be proud of and I, and I, I agree to that and um, I was going to ask you a question um, about this of the civil service you head of and um, how would you rate their performance I think how it, we handled it. I mean, the, the, I mean, the head of the civil service is, of course, the deputy governor, but, yes. I, but I cover, I mean, I'm under the constitution, public service comes under me, but I yes. delegate the, the running of the civil service to, to him. Um, I, I think the civil service did amazingly well during COVID. I mean, we were, there was a lot more working across teams. I mean, I think sometimes working in silos is a challenge for all organisations, and we, we suffer from that here. Uh, but COVID forced a lot of different teams to come together. I think our our NEOC, our National Emergency Operations Centre, and I think Danny Coleman and her team do a do a fabulous job at sort of coordinating all of that. That performed really well. And you know, it wasn't just COVID. We also had a, a tropical storms, we had an earthquake, we had a the dump fire, but but NEOC actually performed extremely well. And that and that's the civil service across our law enforcement agencies, across all the government um, departments and in terms of the health response i mean that was also outstanding i mean from dr lee to to nurse brown i mean there were just so many people who who contributed and and we you know we we really i think saw civil servants going over and above to help people in the community and he just um showed how strong our resilience was yeah and uh, i think we're in a good position right now no one expected what covid would have brought to it changed everyone's lives yeah and it, it was my head to hear we speak of the support of the you know everyone yeah. who played a part yeah. in bringing this thing together because it really was a, it, a entire it, it was a, it was a, it was a team effort and we, in some ways I was quite fortunate during the lockdown because I was just going into work every day and I, I often felt very acutely aware that in the community people were locked locked away at home and there was anxiety there was there was uncertainty about what would happen next. Um, so I think the community, you know, really did pull together. They helped each other. They f followed the the guidance and the and the the, the, the the you know the advice that was that was being given. People still today say to me, "Oh, I loved those supermarket days, Governor. Why can't we? Why can't we go back to those supermarket days? All the all the time you were allotted to to do some exercise." Yes. Um, so yeah, it, it, you know, let's hope we never have to go through anything. Anything like that again? I we could still spend a whole hour here talking about COVID, but I think we could. We I could. Think we're in a better place, yeah, right? We are. We are. And uh, you know, I hope it doesn't happen again. Yeah. We're more more prepared. I think people are more healthy. Yeah. Yeah. They are absolutely changing focus yes. a bit. And the, the domestic partnership bill. Yes. It was a very interesting time. I think a major issue during your tenure. I'm, you know, I just want to hear you how you speak to that yeah. because yeah, I admire and i always said this how you kept yourself so involved right and never taking sides mm. tell me how you were able to manage that i mean i think it, it was quite a a big moment and 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 very 
rare that the that the UK through a governor has to step in 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 that way. I mean, we we had hoped that the that the government would be able to pass legislation, and I give credit to the the then Prime Minister Premier uh, Alder McLaughlin, who did make every effort um, to get that. Uh, then it was called domestic partnerships through, but sadly narrowly didn't get through the parliament so that we did have a court of appeal judgment which was quite clear and said that to to meet our international obligations in this area to to have a framework for same-sex couples uh, the Cayman government needed to pass the legislation or failing that the UK must step in and it was quite clear if this was a the UK must step in to meet its international obligations um, so we, I, I used Section 81 on instructions from the UK, um, but you know there were many people saying at the time, um, "Go further. Why don't you just pass same-sex marriage legislation?" But you know, I, I understood that this was a sensitive matter. It's controversial for a lot of people. We have people who um, have conservative views, um, and and I, I think just going for the civil partnerships approach, um, I don't think anybody was happy because I think the people who didn't want anything had to accept civil partnerships and the people who wanted same-sex marriage also had to accept civil partnerships. So I, I, I felt we, we found a, a, a sort of a middle way through everything that didn't give everybody what they wanted, but also I judged that everybody could just about live with where, with where we were. Um, and we now have hundreds of people who can um, legalize their relationships, both same-sex and heterosexual couples. There are many heterosexual couples who have taken advantage of the civil partnership legislation. People living together who have sorted out their 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 wealth um, issues, sorted out their housing, sorted out their 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 wills. So, so there's a legal framework now. So, um, I don't think the world changed overnight because of the the, the civil partnerships legislation. For the vast majority of people. On Ireland, nothing, nothing really changed. So, my hope is that it was a step forward for the jurisdiction, and that we are more inclusive and more diverse and more, more accepting of of difference um, than, than 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 we were before. Okay. So, if I did it all over again, would you do the same thing? Absolutely. Excellent. I think that yeah. I, I noticed that um, you got a real welcome from the churches, and of course, Cayman is known to be a uh, you know, as um, very strong in this Christian values. Yes, yeah. And this sort of was expected to rub them the wrong way. But I'm seeing they've been more accepting and they, you, the, the way they greeted you and treated yeah. you yeah. in the last couple of years, it, it has shown that they have accepted. And so we sort of moved beyond that. And I think I've heard you mention at some point we we're going to move beyond that. Yeah. And the final question is topic. How do you think we've moved beyond that at this stage? I, I think we have. I think we have moved on for it. And I, you know, I, I've been very careful as governor not to represent one sort of segment of society over another. I'm here to represent everybody. Um, so yes, I've, I've, I've been to on the Pride March, and they invited me to go, and I was very pleased to, to do that. But I've also been to many, many churches across the island. I've attended so many church services all across the island, including in the sister islands. So I, I you know, I've reached out to, to, to many different, um, different groups. And I, I think we, I think we have moved on. Um, and the Privy Council has passed a, a, an important judgment saying that under, under our current constitution, there is no requirement to, to have same sex marriage um, but maybe at some point in the future that will come as well. It's I think it's about giving it time and being patient and allowing people to become more comfortable with with uh, with various ideas. But I think at the moment we've we've, we've got a framework, legal framework, and I, I do feel that, that the community has has moved on. And I, and I think we are a more inclusive community as a result. Excellent. Um, how would you um, classify or how would you speak about the relationship between the UK and the Cayman Islands? I, I think it's in really good shape. I mean, I obviously see what relationships between other overseas territories and the UK are like, and I think ours is one of the best. Um, it's, it's constructive, it's, it's, it's mutually beneficial. Um, there are no, at the moment, no major irritants or major concerns, and that isn't the case in, in, in a number of other overseas territories and I and I think that's that's to the huge benefit of Cayman and, and the UK as well actually. So, you know, my 
I, I have um, made it a, a point to fully support the self-government of Cayman. I mean, the Cayman Islands are run by the Premier, an elected Premier and his ministers. Um, and the UK wants the overseas territories to have the maximum domestic autonomy. Um, but now, because we're an overseas territory, I have some powers to enable the UK to meet its obligations, for example, on the civil partnerships law, to meet the international um, obligations. That was a, a power that, that had to be used, and I, I'm responsible for law and order and security. Um, but outside of that, I have I have um, respected the, the Cayman's autonomy in those areas. And, you know, I may have asked questions, I may have asked about progress, but ultimately they they decide. But I think what the positive UK Cayman relationship does is it means that where there is a request from Cayman for support from the UK, there's a there's an open door. UK is very pleased and very keen to, to help. So, you know, we have uh, one of the things I'm, I'm most pleased about that my office worked on was a climate change risk assessment. Now, I, I, I proposed that under the, the, the previous government um, and they were they were keen but it's been it's really sort of taken off under the the current government with premier panton and yes. we've, we've used two uk ngos the uk has funded the work but we now have a climate change risk assessment for the cayman islands which the premier will use as the basis for a, a new climate change policy so that's again a really good example of where a strong positive uk cayman relationship can can help leverage um, good good progress and get additional technical support, which it is hard for small jurisdictions to have expert knowledge across a wide range of issues. It's um, so so that I think that's a good example of how the relationship can work very well. Uh, I'm not sure many will want that to remain for some time to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've had a change in government while you're here, and I have noticed how you've embraced you know both leaders, both premiers, both governments. And they sometimes find it difficult to understand how you work with these different governments, <laughs> you know, and we'll come to the, the, the topic of the day, yeah. but we just want to know, how do you manage that relationship? You I, can't take sides, but you still have to work with these. I, I, absolutely. You're right. No, that, I think that's a very good way of putting it. I, I can't take sides and, I, and I, should, um, I should try to be balanced and fair yes. in everything that I do. So, I, I mean, again, Paying respect to that point about self-government of, of Cayman, I think a governor's role is to support to the extent you can the government of the day. So, I, you know, my they are elected to run Cayman. I am a, a UK appointed governor and I oversee with the deputy governor the, the civil service. So our job is to implement the governor, government's program. That, 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 that's it. We're here to help the government deliver its program and policies. And if there are problems or challenges in the civil service they come to us and we try and sort them out so so i i then try uh, I, so that that policy that i followed under the former government has been exactly the same under this government i very much want premier panton and his government to succeed and i've done as much as i can behind the scenes to to help in any any areas where where i can play a role and be and be supportive um, so it, so it isn't it isn't that difficult because if you start from that premise that you are de helping the government of the day deliver its program, then it's the same Wh whichever government is in power, and that's that's in a way the the way this the, the, the historical civil service operates in the UK as well. That the civil service is neutral; doesn't matter who the government of the day is. Government changes; civil service carries on to give that government every support it needs, and the civil service advisors but it is ministers who decide on the policies that's our that's our democratic system of government so and um, i hope people can see that i have tried to support both governments that i've that i've worked with and i and i think that's a key part of the role of a governor excellent um well i have to ask this question um, there's a headline last week and um i think you made a response to it and um, would i like to comment on what happened or what the real story behind that? I mean, what you refer? What are you referring to specifically? Okay, where the it was said that the deputy premier, yeah, um, uh, with, uh, resigned because of uh, tension, tension, tension between with, with me. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 and I'd like to be sort of clear. I mean, first of all, I think it was quite shocking that an email exchange um, 
amongst cabinet members was leaked, and that that's it, and that, and that's what has brought this to the attention of the of the public. I mean, obviously, cabinet discussions are there, there, there's a need for them to be confidential so that people have confidence that what they can say is just amongst cabinet members, and that that encourages the free flow of information, the free flow of ideas. So that that was quite sort of shocking that it was leaked. Um, uh, but I would uh, I would say that 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 the tensions between me and the deputy premier, which go back to December and January, had nothing to do with the events of last week. And it's for the premier to um, to talk about that because the premier appoints, excuse me, the premier appoints his ministers. Um, I, I I can give views to the premier, and I can we have exchanges. But ultimately, he appoints his ministers, and it's for him. And um, but I, but I can say that um, you know the issues that arose between myself and the uh, and, and MP Saunders were were related to um, illegal gambling or the numbers game, and also some legislation around the, our anti-corruption framework. Um, and the, there was an attempt made to to frustrate or even to block the anti-corruption uh, legislation when our law enforcement agencies and the anti-corruption commission felt. This was important to, to be in line with international best practice and to enhance our 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 process on illegal gambling or numbers as it's as it's more commonly known. Um, you know that comes squarely under uh, well the, the 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 penalties associated with with that comes squarely under section fifty five and the governor's responsibility. And I wanted to, the cabinet to be aware that the police commissioner and the law enforcement bodies. Um, were urging uh, legislation to toughen our um, our our regime because, frankly, the current legislation is is pretty useless. It really just doesn't doesn't work. Um, now, I, that's a matter for uh, for the Parliament. There's a technical uh, committee of Parliament looking at it, and I hope very much that that they will agree to to pass the legislation. I think sooner or later something will need to be done. Because the, we've had a murder, which was which was tragic, of, of um, former prison officer. We've 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 had armed robberies of people um, using guns to steal the cash from from numbers games. And and in my position, I see some of the other crimes that go on, and some of it unreported, linked to the to the to the illegal gambling. So I think I had the right to to make those points and, and, and you know, I, I swore an oath to the people of the Cayman Islands on the 29th of October that I will well and truly serve the people of the Cayman Islands and I was simply upholding my uh, good government responsibilities in Cabinet. may have been uncomfortable what I said and I, and I accept that, that some people might have felt it was uncomfortable what I was saying, but I had the right to say it and I had the right to say things to make sure that everybody around the cabinet table was aware of the points that I was that I was making and I obviously the the, the sort of the the outburst from the former uh, deputy premier well I, I I know I was quite shocked by that I think a lot of people around the table apologized to me they were embarrassed um, and I think hopefully people who have seen me in action in my four and a half years here will know um, that um, that that and frankly, it's just nonsense. Thank you for your elaborate response. Um, it's always good to hear it all the sides. And I thank you to Tam. Well, on a lighter note, mm. you've been busy. And <laughs> you know at the end of your term. And it's, in a couple of days, you'll be leaving on that nice flat. Sadly, on the, sadly, yeah. Are you going to retirement or are you going to work? Well, <laughs> yeah, retirement's not a word I'm sort of trying to, to use. I still feel as if I've got quite a bit to... To sort of offer, but I am I am leaving the Foreign Office. So I've been in the the UK Foreign Office for almost thirty nine years, and um, Lizzie does want to be at home in the UK with her parents, who are you know are getting quite frail. So, and I probably could have done one more overseas posting, but but because we're going home, I've decided that this is the time to make a make a clean break. But I, I certainly want to be active and and maybe voluntary work I, well I, I i will want to keep busy I, i'm the sort of person who likes to likes to keep busy so I'd, i'm i'm not i wouldn't say it's retiring okay. but we will be permanently based in the uk um probably in a few months time in shropshire which is where our son 
uh, married his, um, his 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 lovely wife um, last year. So we're going to try and buy a new home and have all the family fairly close together. So because you know this diplomatic life, you move around every three or four years. Yes. Lizzie moved around um, as well because her father was in the army. So even as a child, she was moving around every three years. So she's never had a, a permanent home that she's just lived in year after year after year. So that's, so that's really our, our main focus now. Okay, great. So are you going to take your steel fan back with you? <laughs> I thought you might ask me about that. It's already, it's already gone. So, so my, my, um, my heavy baggage, cause yeah. you get, you get a, cause we do have some personal effects and yeah. some small furniture, which is ours, which we brought with us that, so that's all gone back. That went yeah. last week and my steel pan was in there. So it will have, it will have a very special place in our new home and I will get the, get the sticks out every now and again and have a little play, but I've only got three and a half tunes. So don't, don't expect a greatest hits album anytime soon. It might take, uh, might take some time. So I keep my eyes on social media <laughs> because maybe they're playing for, yeah, well, I, for royalty. I, I'm not sure about that. I think I'll be much more low profile when I go, when I go back to the UK. But we have, we have really, really loved it here, Ralph. It's been the privilege of my life to, to serve of, as governor of the Cayman Islands. It, it's, a, it's a truly amazing community and we have challenges everywhere. Everywhere has challenges and every country is grappling with all sorts of difficult issues but there is if you take a step back there is so much to be proud of about the Cayman Islands from our world beating financial services industry highly professional highly efficient and kept us going through COVID um, a tourism product that is the envy of the, the regions um, we have um, a you know, law and order situation that is again one of the safest in the Caribbean and we need to work hard to keep it that way um, we have an independent, highly respected independent judiciary, which I think underpins a lot of a lot of our success. Um, so we 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 should be we should be very proud of um, of, of 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 these islands. And um, you know, I I go away with really really positive positive memories. Well, I personally like to thank you. Well, thank yeah, you for your contribution to the Cayman Islands. Thank you very much. I think many others would agree with me. And I wish you all the best. Well, thank you, Rao. I, I, your future endeavors. I appreciate and it. And please stop by and visit us sometime. All right, definitely. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> I just want to say it's really a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, Ralph, you know, on your 10-year anniversary, I think the paper has really grown leaps and bounds within those 10 years. And the staying power and the longevity of the paper really is a testament to the quality of the content, I think. And I just wanted to ask you, how did you guys really get started and, and what was the sort of um, thrust behind the initial you know, idea for a paper? Well, the first paper was called Employment Weekly. And it started because I wanted to be able to showcase job ads in a different way, maybe by industry, and make it easier for applicants or job seekers, particularly those overseas, to actually find jobs. There was no online access to jobs, and we created a website called Job Market, and that was a sort of uh, addition to the publication itself. So that's where the newspaper got started. It was a newspaper with employment ads and advice and statistics for employment. I was looking at some of the highlights last night of some of the papers uh, through the years, and I was wondering, yes. you know, what were some of the most memorable moments in, for you as a journalist? I know you were actually in, in Cuba when Castro passed away, and I think that was yes. a huge story at the time for you, for, for you as, as a paper, and certainly for the world as well. Uh, what, can you say, can you tell us what some of the more memorable uh, articles and, and, and happenings that, uh, that you guys covered over the years? Well, my goal was to have a different publication than the one we were accustomed to. Um, people were not reading newspapers as they used to because in, news was content and boring and it was a lot of negative information in the headlines. So we decided to create a publication that was more upbeat and positive and sort of looked at the region and how it was affected and how it was going to interact with what we do here. And so therefore, I started traveling to Cuba because I'm fascinated by what took place in Cuba. And I spent a lot of time going there and look at the tourist industry. And so I went over there one weekend to write an article 
and how the tourism industry would impact the Cayman tourism industry. By that time, they had 4 million tourists a year, and we are struggling with 400,000 a year. And we were saying, where are the tourists going? So I went over to write a story on how they were doing it, and maybe we could find some partnerships where some of those tourists would come over to Cayman for maybe two days, and we could benefit from that 4 million uh, number that were going to Cuba. The night I arrived, that was the passing of Castro. Whoa. <laughs> Castro. And so we had to extend our, um, our trip to cover that. And that was a real amazing um, experience. Actually, was in that line for four hours going up to that um, Plaza de Revolution where he was laying in state on that mountaintop. And it was very, very interesting. Wow. I um, and, and through the years, I imagine you've also provided quite a few jobs for people in terms of delivery people, writers. Um, you know, how do you feel about the fact that you're actually contributing to the society in that kind of a way as well? Well, um, as a Caymanian and as someone who, who's made Cayman his home, I have to contribute. I'm, I'm so appreciative to the opportunities that my children got to get university uh, education. And so therefore, if I could find employment for Caymanians or people living here, I'm happy. And it was about doing more than that. We wanted to not only just hire someone working in the industry, but also to display the jobs and have it available so people can really see and apply. And that was basically how the model started. As you know, every newspaper needs to make money from advertisements. So that number of uh, job ads is how really the business started. I just take us back to where we started because we did have some challenges in the first place. You know, so I went into the immigration chief and I said, uh, I would like to start a newspaper. What do I have to do? Because I would have to advertise those jobs and get some revenue at the same time, showcase them to the public. And they said, okay, well, you know, it's a, uh, you know, we're not accepting online advertisements at this time, but you can apply for a license for a newspaper. So I did that. And unfortunately, as I launched my newspaper in March, 2013, I was told that it was not accepted. I could understand oh. why, because it was told to me from the same person that I should get my license in the first place. And so I had some discussions with the government after the day, and uh, I was told, your license should be sufficient. But there were some challenges, and we overcame them after a year. Had to use my, my um, attorney at that time. And uh, we finally got through and we started advertising jobs. And, and that was how we started out. It took me so long to get accepted for advertising jobs that I decided to become a full-blown newspaper and it became now Business and Employment Weekly. So we were now covering business and employment. And then someone said, just call it Cayman Weekly. So we call it Cayman Weekly and we were covering everything from cruise ship arrivals to death announcements to school stories to employment stories. We actually had a section um, highlighting how employees were doing in the uh, industry and sort of giving visibility to top performers. Yes. I, I imagine there was quite a bit of um, growth for the paper uh, during COVID as well, because I know that a lot of people will recognize you uh, from, from, from the press briefings and the questions that you asked during that time. Uh, what, what has been the residual sort of um, effect on the paper uh, post COVID? Well, we actually were doing extremely well prior to COVID. I mean, we had five papers per week. We are running a daily paper Monday to Friday, and that happened in the January before COVID started. So at the end of March, we were at the pinnacle of our performance for the newspaper. We were doing very well. We were about to bring on about four more staff. And then in the end of March, we had COVID. I asked one of my um, reporters to cover the press briefings because we didn't know how much press briefings were going to be happening. We didn't know how long it would take. But So I sent one of my reporters down there, and then we were like, in the space of two or three days, we were like, okay, we're going to shut down the country. And I like, this is getting very serious. So I decided I had to be the face of Caymanian Times out there because this was serious questions. I knew the governor very well. I knew the premier very well and the government very well. And I knew Cayman. I've been here for over 30 years. And I said, I need to get involved in this. And so... Getting there, we ended up staying in, 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 the, in the community's eyes for a number of months. 
And people say, oh, Ralph, I appreciate the question you asked. Up to Thursday, a lady came to me and said, I recognize you from the press briefings. Yeah. And that's three years after the fact. But people said, I had nothing else to do. We waited every day for those press briefings. We saw the governor and the premier, and we saw the media, and you were the asking questions. And we appreciated the questions you were asking because of what we wanted to hear. So that sort of boosted um, Caymanian times. But also what happened was that I saw the need to have more of a live presence. And this is where the talk show came and conversations comes into the picture because piggybacking on that presence in the media and live, of course, online and in the radio, we decided, okay, here's an opportunity for us to grow our platform, not only in print, but also speaking with clients, having interviews, doing what we're doing here, sharing this live and also on YouTube and Facebook. Right. And that's and so we you're pumping back up. You're, you're, you're publishing two times a week. Uh, is it bi-weekly now? Or are you guys publishing three times a week? And, and what's the sort of trajectory going forward? We are, we are currently doing uh, two days per week, Wednesday and Friday. We moved to three days last year. But because of the logistics with getting flights in on a weekend, it wasn't possible to have a Monday paper. And so once flights have settled down and we can get regular flights over the weekend, we'll probably go back to three days a week because the demand is there. We have readers looking for Monday paper right now, as we speak. And so therefore, the plan is to go back to three days a week. Uh, we know that many think that newspapers are going away, but believe me, newspapers are here to stay. Yeah. Of course, it complements the online access, and we do have a website, and we're going to have this uh, uh, access to uh, conversations, but it's a culmination. It's a uh, a group of media outlets on the one um, company, on the one publisher that can access information and share it with the wider public, local and overseas. And that's the goal, to be able to use these multiple outlets to get our message across. And that's what we're going for. We'll probably go three days a week in the printed paper, but now we're going to have our came on conversations four days a week, Monday to Thursday, noon at 12.30 to 2. And we also have our online, where we have our social media pages and our website, keeping everyone informed. Yes, yes. Something I alluded to earlier um, was, the, was the type of content that uh, is associated with your paper. And I know you make your, your editorial decisions, you know, quite judiciously. Um, what what are some of the things that influence you when you're deciding what to put in the paper, content, uh, from a content perspective? I keep my finger on the pulse. And I believe in any industry, anything you do, experience is a great teacher. Knowledge of your surroundings and the environment um, is invaluable. So because of my time in the Cayman Islands, um, I started as a banker in 19... You know, in, in yes, 1981 in the Cayman Islands. And that has given me access to information experience. And I can speak to many different topics. So when I see life as it is, and events, and news stories, some may not be interesting, some may be, but we um, have a, a, the, the advantage of looking at it through different lenses. And that way it helps me to sort of publish a story in a different light. You know, I look for more the positive angles rather than the negative angles by informing people and educating people. And that's one of the reasons why my stories on my front pages are different to other publications. But the thing is, people are reading them. So they're getting a the message, but a different way. And that's the key to being able to reach your audience with a message or a story, but have been able to make it different to the other publications because I don't believe we should be reporting the same story in the same fashion. And so it's about finding and reporting the same, because news is news. You know, what happened last week in the Cayman Islands with the resignation of a minister, it, it's, it's news, but we found different ways of telling that story. And that's where my publishing experience and expertise comes into play. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, uh, um, I mean, um, there's something to be said for uh, doing things in a way that uh, is palatable for all, uh, everyone in the society, and everyone can, you know, pick up a paper and, uh, you know, 
it's, it's an edifying experience when you read a Caymanian Times. You know, everyone walks away feeling a bit more enlightened about what's happening here. Yeah. Uh, Ralph, you're still a very young man. Um, <laughs> the paper is moving along swiftly. Uh, do you have a concession plan in terms of, you know, what you'd like to see happen to the paper when, you know, as, uh, when you move on, as we all do? Well, um, many of may know that I took early retirement at the age of 49. And um, that was for many, but personal reasons as well. But my whole goal was to develop a company and to work in an industry where I could contribute to the development of our young people and the residents of, of the Cayman Islands. And so with my background in finance and banking, I started wanting to teach people how to manage money. That is so critical. As we move forward, realize that money management is so important. Knowledge of the economy and, and talking to people about what's happening around them, explaining in terms that they can understand, not allowing the jargon to confuse people. So therefore, with experience and age comes the ability to communicate at different levels. And so where am I today at age 63, which I just celebrated this week well, <laughs> recently. <yeah. laughs> thank you, thank you. I am able to now translate, or converse, or create information that can pass on to all ages from all levels of society and inform and educate them. And that's what my goal is um, as I grow older, is to pass on knowledge. Because like, and one of my teachers told me, when an old person buy, dies, a library is burnt to the ground. There's so much knowledge from our elderly, and that's why I respect them so much, that you can learn so much. So we have to capture that information. And so you will see me in future discussions and conversations, bring down elderly people, older than myself, I still consider myself young, and um, absolutely. I, and I was not being facetious when I said that. You were. <laughs> yes. I mean, you're you're quite you're still quite a young man. So that's why I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, what what yeah. in you know another 20, 30 years in the in the business is is you know is, is quite foreseeable. And so yes. that's why I asked the question. You know. Yes. Um, and, 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 and so to answer your question directly, where I see myself, I'm committed to media. I will develop the, co the company to have more uh, writers, uh, maybe a publisher, and I'll be at the helm of the company, um, traveling as I love to do, sharing information from around the region, but also ensuring that we have balanced media in the Cayman Islands. And as we say, I feel that's another conversation that we may have to touch on in a moment, but I'm very concerned for the media, the levels of media in the Cayman Islands. And that's one of the reasons I decided to stay in it for that. Uh, keep staying with that topic. Uh, I wanted to talk yeah. to you about some of the, 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 the topical issues that are happening in, in the society now. Some of the yes. things that, are, are, that we know are going on um, that are being discussed in a public domain, but also things that we may not be aware of uh, that are not being uncovered because of the, 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 you know, the, the, the deficiency um, in terms of... Um, investigative journalism um, yes Cayman, that aspect of, of the business i mean we, there's some of it happening again and we're happy to see you know there are some platforms that are you know taking an investigative approach um how do you yeah. feel about where things are at how we're how we're uncovering information not just how we're distributing or disseminating the information but how we're actually going about uncovering the stories okay. well and that question was asked to me years ago um, Ralph, when are you going to do this investigative reporting? Just report what's happening and what is doing. And I had to explain to the, con the individual who asked me, it's not as simple as that. As you know, in news operations, media houses is a business. We have to be able to pay our bills. A news operation that is owned by someone who's wealthy, who just wants to have power, it's a totally different type of news operation, and they will look after their interests. We need to have independent media who consider, you know what, this is a successful, viable business, and therefore we're able to pay our way from our sales. To have that done, and I'm a businessman, I believe in running a business properly, not asking for any um, favors or any donations. I believe a business should be run from the sales and the profits that exist and so that's where i run my business i produce a product that 
my readers or my clients would want to purchase. And so to the point of investigative journalism, in the Cayman Islands, we have to understand small society. And so you have to know when to make your moves or when to cover certain stories because it can impact your sales. And it's reality. Yes, we should not be worried about, oh, that person not gonna buy ads from me, but it impacts your sales. So you, when you investigate a story, you have to be mindful of the impact to the business. What I've learned is that you have to establish a base. You have to make sure that your company is solid. So when you go to write a story on a certain individual or a certain topic, that you don't have to worry about, am I going to lose business from that person? And we spent our time building up our, up our reserves and establishing a platform that we can now start to report on things and write stories. And if you notice in the last six months, we have started to touch on topics that nobody would want to talk to touch on. We started writing about the Cerro Mar Beach um, situation where the beach is destroyed. And we made just suggestions as to should we continue to develop or not. We started to look at um, the governments and how its performance. We wrote a, a commentary just, just yesterday and it spoke to um, the resignation of the, the, de the deputy premier and how would that impact the country. We actually spoke to uh, if the deputy premier was doing so well, what went wrong, but nobody knows he asked more questions. So we're starting to do a lot more of that because we feel more comfortable that, you know what, we can now talk on topics that should not impact how our business operates. We can feel comfortable that our revenues are coming in and we do have enough reserves to keep us in business. When you don't have that choice and you're thinking about whether I'm going to stay afloat or not, you will have some reservations about how you do your business and do your job. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Very understandable. And I imagine, you know, I think when people are are looking for a paper to read, they know that uh, they, they know that Caymanian Times is going to give the story uh, and they're going to get all sides to yes. a story. So I think that's also very important. Uh, and, I've had the pleasure of also working along with you on some uh, on some articles, and I've yes. I've always had great respect for the way that you the dec your decision making. Um, that's something that has, has always stuck with me, and that's something that's influenced even the way I do my own personal sort of, uh, you know, when I'm trying to be um, judicious about something. I, I think, you know, well, yeah. you have to look at all of the sides. So that's something I really agree with. Yes. There's a method to the madness, and room was not built in a day. A business takes about six years to really start to mature, maybe longer. We've been in business 10 years, I'm just starting. There's so much to build and we have to understand our goals and where we're going. We can't just rush into business because, oh, it looks nice. We have to understand where we want to achieve. And you find that like building a house, if you take your time and build a foundation properly, you will get a house that will last long. If you rush through it, a hurricane comes in, it might just cause some damage. So, but the whole idea, especially about this business, and I think you have a lot of experience in reporting more than I do, because I'm back with sure. We, it takes different people coming together to make it happen. But you have to have someone who is there to guide. And we, one of my other writers call this, uh, you have to have this publisher who understands the business and understands how some stories really relate. Because as a writer, you may not see all ends, or you might not see it from the perspective of someone who owns the business, but you can appreciate if there's someone to, to just verify these decisions and think about it and i say sleep on it overnight you'll be able to make better decisions that not only affect you the writer but not the business but also the readers and we have to understand that we are writing for the readers we want readers to read our stories and believe that what they're reading makes sense not read to ask questions and to make jokes about it as some write as some publications may do but it's about educating ourselves. And there's a place for you know jokes and comedy and entertainment. But I take my reporting in my industry very seriously. And um, one thing that I was concerned about is that Cayman has fallen behind 
in the, in, 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 in media. The reason for this, we have no television. It's hard to understand that the Cayman Islands is one of the few islands in the world that don't have television. There are other countries who are not as wealthy as we are, but and have two or three channels. We need to fix that um, and find a way of making it work because TV is just something that is part of society. You know, I shouldn't have to look on Facebook to see a, a, a news, a news, um, a, a news event or get my regular news. There should be TV. And also the, the newspaper channels and the media channels. And we have to sort of do a little better. I've recommended having a, a committee or a policies in place for how we operate media in the Cayman Islands. And that has not started yet. So we are operating, you know, in silos. Interesting. And so, Ralph, the radio um, spin-off from the yes. paper. Uh, what's what's sort of the idea behind that? Is it you're going to be looking more deeply at the at some of the content in the paper as well as some of the topical issues of the day? And uh, what's what's what sort of the genesis of that idea? Well, I was always into music, and as a musician <laughs> yourself, we have a love for that, uh, you know, that talent, and how your musician, singer, recording artist, you know, a writer, um, the DJ plays what people's rap records. And so I spent years of my life in that industry. There's some work in a radio station back in my hometown of Montserrat. And so I always had a passion for radio. And I always said that at the end of my career, I'm going to have a radio station. This is a step forward that direction. It's not just all about news but there has to be other entertainment, including music. And so this is the first step in that direction. And so therefore we're gonna sort of um, work with a local station, FM 89.1, and therefore we're gonna have a news, a talk show on that station. But the goal is to get our own radio station with news, music, entertainment. And so that's definitely gonna come. That's my passion to have an outlet, a full blown radio station which would include talk shows, news items, education, entertainment, and so a spot for local musicians. Because I do believe that we have not given the visibility to our local musicians as we should have. With all the money that we have in this country, our local musicians should not be out there struggling to make it happen, should not be having to have two or three jobs, should be able to go out there and focus on music there was some attempts made in the past, but it just went away. We need to decide that music, which is a big industry. For example, who is one of the ambassadors for Barbados? Rihanna. There's talent in the Cayman Islands, and I've seen it, that we need to give more visibility to. And the media needs to play a part in that. That's and so true. therefore, when your radio stations feel that like they have to pay 5% of local music, that is not acceptable. And nobody should have to put it in law that you must pay more than, you have to pay more than 5%. It should be something that you're proud of as a Caymanian, that you're living here, you should want to play your own music a lot more than the foreign music. So it's not that you have to give me laws to tell me you must play a certain amount of music, but I should be willing and happy to expose and reach out. I mean, look at Jamaican reggae music. Look around us. You go to Honduras, you go to Cuba, you go to all the islands around us, and you'll see that they have exposed their talent, their musical talent, and they've gone far. But we are behind the ball in that. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said that. Uh, you know, it's uh, something I've been trying to champion for some time. And um, sometimes, you know, you're you can feel like you're the only one thinking a certain way. So I'm glad that, uh, that you've echoed my sentiments in that regard as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and just to finish on that, and there are things that we're going to be doing here as we move forward with our media platform. Because as you know, media is power. And anyone tells you, if you are into media, you have a lot of power. Just look around, I'm not going to call names, and you'll see who wields the power. Not only in the Cayman Islands, but if you look at CNN, the Foxes, you could say CNN was responsible for the new presidency we have now. 
if you look at the campaign they ran against the Republicans, they were so aggressive and they won. Yeah. It just goes to show you the power of media and reaching people. And if we have that power in our hands and wield it properly, we can achieve the goal we want to achieve. And that's why I'm so committed to staying in this business. And I've created a model that is very low cost, very low. Like we are operating here on, in, I'm in my office, you're in your living room, and we're gonna reach thousands of people, even more, internationally and locally. And it's for very low cost. And so therefore this just shows you that with technology and the right heart, we can reach the masses and get the media business and get the music business back where it's supposed to be. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of other ventures, uh, um, you know, what's your view in, in terms of some of the banking sector here in Cayman? Are we still are we still among the world's best? I do believe so. I do believe so. there's a great amount of confidence in the Cayman Islands banking industry, but we cannot get complacent. Um, unfortunately, I'm not hearing enough from our bank association on what's happening around the world with the banking crisis, as they call it. And we need to be aware. And if, if you don't hear things, you tend to believe many things. And so therefore, we need to be updated on a regular basis from those regulators. I haven't got any releases or any information. And people say, well, you don't come and ask me questions. I am the media. You should be happy to bring information to the media. The media should be out investigating what is normally happening everywhere else. You know, the bankers are having a problem. The banks in the world, in Switzerland are having problems. They don't have to go and ask them. They get information on the desk the next morning. In America, they had this, um, you know, Silicon Valley crisis. It was in the media's pocket the next morning. We need to have information as what's happening in the Cayman Islands in relation to the banking in, in the banking industry and just show up every point that you know what the, the world is having a challenge but we are good our banks are stable there's liquidity we are strong no need yes, to have yes. that is needed That's, that, that should be happening 100 percent. because my understanding is that uh some of these some of the banks in america were over leveraged in, ter in terms of the, their, their bonds and they were long bonds short deposits yeah. and yeah uh, and you, if, if people didn't allow the, 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 their, their bonds to, to go to maturity and they decided to take the money early, then the banks couldn't meet their obligations. Yes. Um, yeah. is there, is, is, are the banks in Cayman leveraged that way? Or are, are they, are they how, how do, I mean, fractional reserve banking would tell us that for every dollar we put in the bank, they can lend a certain amount. But we don't know how the, what the money markets, how the, our banks use money markets, uh, what their, you know, what what their ethos is, and so these are some of the questions I think. Yes. Well, I would, I would need to have someone from the Bankers Association address those questions, or from SEMA. But I left the banking industry in two thousand and five. That's quite a while ago, and things have changed. General banking should remain the same, and I believe that. There's a lot of liquidity to go around that the banks are in good standing, so there should be no need to have around the banks in Cayman. But I'm not in a position to speak to it. In these conversations, I plan to bring on someone or invite someone from the bank industry to come and speak to this. But we should have heard from it already. That's my point. Yeah. I would love to answer those questions, but I'm not in a position to do it. And I'm mindful of the responsibility of the media not to spread rumors. Yeah. We to give facts. And we can't allude to a topic if we don't have the details. Um, something happened on Friday, which um, we're gonna, I'm going to have a discussion with the governor and a program today. Um, you know, when we have an interview with the governor, the last interview, and there was an article that spoke to um, a rift between the deputy premier and the uh, and the governor, and it was in a sense that. Maybe that was the reason why he left. Well, the night that was that so was released, the governor said he had nothing to do with it. So we need to know what went on, what went on. And so therefore the governor said, okay, I have no, 
it wasn't man or nothing with what to do with me, why he's designed well, it should not be sent that way. So what the point I'm taking is that we need to get information coming to us instead of us having to go and dig up information because we need to know what's going on. The bank industry, uh, I'm sure it's, it's solid in Cayman Islands, but I cannot speak to that. And so there are questions out there. So we will try to get somebody to come on and, and speak to it. Of course, we are aware of the interest rate hikes that are coming on a regular basis and interest rates and loans have never been this high before in the, in the recent years, which is impacting the whole industry. The real estate as well. Uh -huh. and real estate, yes. Um, what we're seeing now is that banks are tightening up on their lending. And that's one of the impacts of raising interest rates. Nobody knows that. So I have clients come and say, but Ralph, I'm having difficulty getting loans quickly. I say, well, from what I'm hearing on, on the new international news is that banks are going to slow down their lending or credit's not going to be available because they want to store the economy and, and reduce inflation. It makes sense, but we need to talk about these things and educate our people. Yes, because I think if the interest rates are raising, certainly the deposit, uh, the, the interest on deposits should also be <laughs> should exactly. be mirroring, exactly. should be exactly. mirroring exactly. those interest rates, at least to some yeah. degree. And, and it is, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. Yes. Um, you know, and, and these are topics that we could go into for days, and you know, I mean, we're happy to touch on them here, but yeah. I would like to have these discussions again candidly with you, Stuart. I really appreciate, you know, the, your line of reasoning, your, you know, the way you operate, your way you, you research your news, you know, and the things that you talk about with a heartfelt feeling is, is so good to me and encourages me to research these, these details more. So I, I would love to have this discussion with you again, and we could talk about some other other topics on a regular basis yes yes indeed and I, and you know like i said i just want to take this opportunity once again to congratulate you on on you know a successful 10 years i know it hasn't been easy uh you've been an inspiration to all of us uh and you know we really appreciate what you do and what you're continuing to do as both as a professional and as a person in the community and uh hats off to you ralph and uh uh, happy 10th anniversary to Cayman in Times. It's really been a privilege and, and a pleasure for me to spend this time with you this morning, interviewing you. I uh, have the utmost respect for you, and I hope to do this again soon. Okay. Thank you very so much, brother. Have a great evening. I look forward to have another strong and heartfelt conversation with you. Bye-bye. Take care now. Take care. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to tune in tomorrow for a conversation with Mr. Roy Budden. We invite you to tune in tomorrow for conversations with Mr. Roy Budden and Mr. Mark Langevin as we continue to discuss topical issues that affect the Cayman Islands. Remember to like, share, and follow our social media pages and pick up copies of Caymanian Times newspaper on Wednesdays and Fridays at location across the islands. Have a great evening and see you tomorrow.